Why do tactics, techniques, and procedures matter? Well, let's look at the pyramid of pain as an example here. We've got hash values, which are trivial for the adversary to overcome. We have IP addresses that are easy. We have domain names that are simple. And then network and host artifacts become annoying for the adversary to overcome. And as we get higher in the pyramid, it gets more difficult. Tools become challenging and tactic techniques and procedures are tough. So mitigating and defending at that layer obviously makes it very, very difficult for the adversary to be successful. Now let's just walk through this a little bit. So let's drill into this analysis by Talos around ransomware Tesla crib. Now we can see a bunch of hashes here and the hashes are trivial for the adversary to overcome. So, so why? Because it's easy for the adversary to overcome the hash that you're blocking. And so if you take this list and you put it in, you're gonna block everything that's known. And if nothing changes, you're good to go. But if the adversary wants to make a change, it's as easy as using something like MSF Venom and having the ability to create a new payload that has a new hash. Now, could you do this dynamically? Certainly. So as the example here, I've got the ability to do a reverse shell and it's malicious. And if it was known to be malicious, it would be blocked. Adversary can change that hash. Running the exact same command in this example, I've got a different output. So this becomes fairly trivial for the adversary to overcome. It's a control needed nonetheless, but it is certainly easy for the adversary to overcome. Now let's look at IP addresses. We've got a list of IP addresses here. We can go ahead and feed that into our uh, controls, whether that's through a dynamic feed that comes in or we're manually adding these into our controls. The bottom line is, is that known malicious IP address, blocked, done. Adversary uses something like fast flux that's fronted by a domain and a, a list of IP addresses that it continues to rotate through. Now, could you have technology to help you identify this? Certainly. But if you're taking the IP address and you're blocking it, as long as nothing changes, you've blocked that threat. But most likely the adversary is going to overcome that control and they're going to do it fairly easily. FastFlux is an example of that. Now the control again is bypass. Now we move up higher in the stack. Now we're into domain names. And so again, no malicious domain, quite easy to block uh, and add that control. Again, this is going to be through some type of intelligence feed or manual intervention, but you will add it to your control. But what happens if they're using a domain generated algorithm and they're changing up that domain constantly? Now, can you reverse engineer the algorithm to predict the future domains that are going to be in that list? Certainly can do that, uh, but you can't always do that. And therefore, the control that you have, again, will be bypassed. So you can see at least for hash values, IP addresses, and domain names, controls I'm not saying aren't worth adding. They certainly are. They're going to get rid of a lot of the noise. They are going to block stuff. But the adversary is going to be able to overcome them fairly, fairly easily. Uh, in comparison. Now, as we continue to move higher up in the stack, we get into network artifacts. Now, network artifacts is the ability to observe network activity that's being created by the adversary. And this could include things like URI patterns, C2 information that's embedded into protocols. You've got distinctive HTTP user agents, SMTP uh, mailer values, et cetera. And this example is showing where they're reaching out to an HTML page. Uh, the domain happens to be blocked here and that page is no longer available can't access it. And so that controls in place today. Now let's assume a few things here. Let's assume that they're using uh, some type of D DGA. So domain generated algorithm that reaches out to this domain that accesses this HTML page. And maybe there's an exploit kit here or some type of adversarial element to their uh, their attack chain. And, and so we've been able to reverse engineer the domain generated algorithm and predict the future and therefore uh, block any attempted connection to any of those future domains. So that's pretty neat. We've got that control. Why it's annoying for the adversary is having to go back now 
and recreate, redevelop the malware with a new and improved domain generated algorithm as an example, or, or a completely other method. But you can see here that now I've got to take some time. I've not only got to recreate it, I may even have to find ways to redistribute the payload. I could use maybe the existing capability that I had in the past if it was successful, but there's a good chance maybe some of those other lower elements have been identified now as well. Anyways, you can see how this could be annoying for the adversary because now the cost of doing business on their side has increased and the control is bypassed. Once they get this in place, uh, they start rolling it out. Maybe we can't reverse engineer this DGA and can't predict. And therefore this particular control is um, no longer suffice. Now we look at the host artifacts. These are observables, uh, again, caused by the adversarial's activities. Now this could be on one or many hosts and it could include things like registry keys, it could be values known to be created by specific pieces of malware files and directories. And so you can see the content here. We've got some indications of compromises and it includes things like, you know, registry entries, mutexes, files and, and, and or directories created, etc. And so if you're looking or trying to mitigate certain areas here, as an example, one of the references, HKey current user software, Microsoft, Windows current version, Action Center. And in fact, what it does is it gets rid of any notifications here. For example, if I was to disable your antivirus or anti-malware capability on your asset, Windows has the ability to say, hey, you know, important message, this is uh, disabled. If I can get rid of that notification, obviously I'm under the radar a little bit here. If that's something that you're looking for to identify whether or not there is an indication of compromise, meaning that this has now been disabled, fair enough. That, that might help you discover and determine that you have been compromised. Now, if the adversary wanted to overcome something like this, or you had a block, some type of check and balance that didn't allow this mechanism to take place, and, and again, this is a very trivial mechanism, but the example is the same. I've got to programmatically make the changes within the malware itself to not introduce this indication of compromise, right? Or this additional noise that could be detected from the defender's tool bag. So again, difficult, just like network artifacts, they fall under the same um, category here as annoying. All right, tools, this is where it becomes challenging. So this example here could be uh, in order for me to effectively encrypt the asset, I need to delete all shadow copies. So I've got to, I have to have the ability to go in and ensure that you have no means of recovery. And therefore, when I do encrypt the drive, I have the ability to enforce that ransomware, right? I'm in a better position for you to pay. Now, if I do something as simple as remove local administrator access from user John from having the ability to manipulate shadow copies using VSS admin on a Windows asset as an example, or I have a remote capability that does this mechanism and it's controlled remotely and they don't have privilege to make change, it makes it difficult again for the adversary, right? It's a tool that it requires uh, administrative privilege. And if I revoke that capability, the adversary is not going to be able to stop recovery. And so from their perspective, they're gonna need another way to impact or force payment. And that's difficult, right? Because if you're not locking up the box, then what do you do? Maybe then you move to extortion, right? And, and, and then now I need to rewrite malware to maybe upload or search for personal data. Maybe that was part of of the malware initially, but let's assume it wasn't. It was really around ransomware and encrypting the drive, not extortion. So if I have to go back and redevelop and recreate the method that I'm using to make the victim pay, again, very costly. And in this case, the controls are relevant. So when the adversary changes their methods here, then the existing control that I may have had in place doesn't matter here. But again, the effort on the adversary side is, is quite high. This is an example of this ransomware detonated in a sandboxed environment. And you can see very quickly, it not only talks about the behavioral indicators, but more importantly, 
the MITRE attack alignment around the tactics that are being used in these behavioral indicators. Obviously, this then allows us to pivot and understand more about that attack at the tactic, technique, and subtechnique level. But it gives you a good perspective that there is TTPs here that I could focus on. So why are TTPs so valuable for defenders? This is how the adversary goes about accomplishing their mission. This includes things like reconnaissance all the way up to data exfiltration and every step in between. This is the how. And so if I'm able to mitigate the risk here, it makes it very, very costly for the adversary to overcome. For example, Tesla Crypt and its variant Alpha Crypt have to encrypt the drive, right? And this gives an example of the impact here, data encrypted for impact. This is the sole mechanism here or one of the core mechanisms here. And if I'm able to understand the impact, the technique is data encrypted, that's the impact. And if I can mitigate their ability to encrypt that drive, it's very, very difficult for them to overcome. So an example of that might be that maybe the tools on the box still exist. I can't get rid of WMI or PowerShell. In this case, I can't get rid of shadow copies. These are important mechanisms for my operation. And so I can't completely get rid of them. But what if I had a tool that does detect the behavior when encryption starts? So um, it identifies that files are starting to be encrypted one or two may get encrypted, and then it stops and kills that process automatically. So now I have been impacted, but very minimal. I've got a couple of files that are encrypted. I got my VSS backup. I've got my shadow copies. I can do some restoration here. I've got my offline uh, tools that can do some restoration, but very, very little impact considering. And I've stopped the adversary from fully encrypting the entire asset. And again, if the more that they encrypt, the more operational burden it is on me to do the restoration, right? How old is the data? All those other challenges start to come into play. But if I'm able to kill it early, only at a cost of a couple of files, how does that adversary overcome that? Very, very difficult. So that's why TTPs are so critically important. So if they bypass that IP, that hash, that domain name, the artifacts, the tools, the tactic and technique are still the same. Very hard for the adversary to overcome. Doesn't matter about the IPs and the hashes and the domain names now. Now, I'm not saying those controls don't exist. You certainly want those controls, but you can see if I have the ability to move up in the stack, I make it very, very difficult. And so now for the adversary, in order to be successful here, they need to find another way. What's that other way? Well, there's all kinds of other ways. Maybe now they wanna just steal credentials. And so they have to recreate their malware to include things like Mimi Cats or Mimi Cats like to be able to harvest credentials once they get a hold of that asset to elevate privilege, have the mechanisms that they might need, and they might not have the ability to do ransomware. So their mission has changed. So now they might be looking at extortion looking for intellectual property, personal data, and using that to get an advantage over the victim in hopes they'll pay. Or maybe they just cause harm and outage and disruption. Either or, very, very difficult for the adversary to come because encrypting the drive is going to be very, very difficult. So when we look at this analysis done by Talos on this particular ransomware, you can see that they've done a very good job of including the details here around MITRE and every one of the tactics and techniques that may have been associated to this particular campaign. And again, this increases the cost of the adversary to be successful within an organization. So if we can start looking at opportunities here that we can mitigate and change the outcome based on the tactic and technique and procedure being leveraged, it's very, very difficult. And we're seeing more and more of this from Talos, which is amazing, where they're going through and they're including this detail, including the ability to download this and import this into the Navigator tool itself. So maybe the adversary gives up, I doubt it. But anyways, that's why TTPs are critically important. Focus on the opportunity they give defenders when defending. Mm -hmm.